Okay, so what did we talk about? What was the main theme of last week's lesson? Wasn't it like to like the times are Yeah, don't stop believing in God when times get tough. When you are, you know, that when you're sad or you're in pain or you're struggling, turn to God, not away from God. I've seen so many people where that has happened. Where they get angry at God because things aren't going exactly how they want in their lives. And, and that's possible for any one of us at any time to have that happen. I've known people that lived for God apparently for decades and decades and then got angry because he didn't answer a prayer or things didn't go exactly as they wanted them to. And last week's lesson and last week's verses was a reminder to each one of us that no matter what's going on in your life, you should allow that to drive you to God. If it's happiness, praise God. Worship Him. Thank Him for the goodness that you can see Him working out in your life. If it's a time of sadness, turn to God and pray and ask for His strength and His help. Because... He is real, and He is there, and He does want to hear us, and He does love us, no matter how tough a time we're going through. Now comes the interesting part. There are basically three types of psalms in the book of Psalms, three different styles of verses. And we're going to use some big words, and you guys are going to be so smart after we're done here. <laughs> Someday you're going to use these words, and your teacher's going to be like, whoa! Really? Okay, so the first type or first style of verse in the book of Psalms is what they call synonymous parallelism. In other words, it's take an idea and repeat an idea in a similar way but slightly different. It's not just word for word. Jack and Jill went up the hill. Jack and Jill went up the hill. But it's more like Jack and Jill went up the hill. Jill and Jack walked up the... the uh, rise in the ground. Ground. The what? Rise in the, the ground. The rise in the ground. Good job. Yes, exactly. You're getting it. That is what synonymous means. Synonymous means basically similar or the same thing. And parallelism is just two lines together. And then there's antithetical. Who knows what anti means? Abby? Against. Against. So you take two parallel phrases and you put them against one another or in opposition to another. And so you have, it's often structured, here's the idea, this is what you should be doing, and here is the bad idea, this is what you should not be doing. And then the last one is synthetic parallelism, and this is take one idea and then add something else to it that's different than the original idea, but that works together with the same idea. And synthetic is the root of it is the idea of synthesis or putting two parts together. And so you can kind of see, and if you think back over the lessons we've had already in Psalm 119, you can see each one of these types. But but what this does though, as you're reading it, is it helps you go, oh, this is what the author's trying to do. It kind of helps you see into the author's mind and also into the Holy Spirit and how he's trying to help us learn something. So now I want you guys to go through, and I want you to figure out in your groups for each verse what type it is. So on your piece of paper, we're going to look at verses 32 through 40. So on the margin there, go ahead and write 32 and 33. Uh, Psalm 119, verses 32 through 40. You go ahead and write down the verses and then leave space and you're going to either write a 1, a 2, or a 3 next to it for those types. So let's go ahead, open your Bible to Psalm 119, verse 32 through 40. I hope that this helped open your eyes a little bit to some of the things that are kind of going on behind the scenes. The things that you would sort of, once somebody pointed it out to you, you go, oh, yeah, I guess that is what he's been doing all along. But until somebody points out, hey, wait a second, this is what he's doing, you might just miss it. So, we're going to start looking at these verses here, and then we'll let you know which each type is. 
And the first verse is, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. So, what did you guys get for that verse? Three? Yeah, I got a three as well. In that, that one is adding another idea to, or as a um, synergistic, <laughs> It is a synergistic parallelism. Big words, I know. But you're going to be so smart in school. Your teacher's going to be so proud. All right, it goes on. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Three again, yes. He takes two separate ideas and joins them together. Give me understanding. Now, on both of these verses, we don't want to get lost in the weeds of, of what type of verse it is and miss the meaning. But in both of these, he's asking God to help us get to know God and to live for God. Um, both of these verses, he is saying, God, help me know your laws, help me understand your laws, so I can live my life for you. Because God does have laws. And I know it, in our culture today, in America, a lot of people don't like the idea of a God that would tell you or me how to live or how not to live. And yet that is exactly what the God of the Bible does. And if we really, truly believe in Him, then we are going to work our whole life. We are going to ask for His help and strive and fight against our sin nature makes us want to do wrong. We're not just going to give in and be like, oh, I'm just comfortable in my sin for our, the rest of our life. There will be conviction. God will be knocking on the door going, hello, what are you doing? And here the author is saying, God, I need your help to know you, to know your laws so that I can live for you. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. What, what type of verse is that, Jordan? Type 3, yes. Taking two ideas, a synergy, and putting them together. Make me walk in the path of your commandments before, because I delight in it. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Like God, make me do this because I really want to do this. God make me do this because it makes me happy when I do this. But it, it's almost like the author is saying, and yet it's a struggle for me. He, he's recognizing that you and I and he need help from God to cause us <coughs> to live for God. And this next one really intrigued me. It says, Incline my heart to your testimonies, in other words, God's word, what God has said, and not to dishonest gain. So let me ask you this. What type of verse is this first? Lisa? We had two. Two. Antithetical. He's taking two ideas that are opposites. Oh, God, help me want to live for you. And so I was trying to think of how do I illustrate this point, and I find it, found a video of what happens when you incline something towards another object, something towards a goal. Now, on the physical, or in the physical realm, um, an incline is basically a hill, a small hill, a big hill. Yes, Jordan. Like, I know I'm like, I've been all the words, but I don't get, I don't get each other. Okay. Well, um, he is saying, God, help me to want to do <coughs> your will. Because the author realized that each one of us have in our hearts what's called a sin nature. And so we don't naturally just want to do the right thing all the time. We don't always want to get up and read our Bible in the morning. We don't always want, just can't wait to obey mom and dad and clean my room and do my homework. We're like, yeah! So fun. 
you always hear the TV calling or your iPod or, you know, and we can go on down a list. We can look around us in the world today and see that sin nature, that inclination of the heart. It's kind of like, have you guys ever gone to the grocery store and got a shopping cart that had a bent wheel? Yes. And as soon as you let go of that cart, it always goes left. Doesn't matter what you do, as soon as you stop like forcing it to go straight, all of a sudden it goes left. Well, that's a picture of something that's inclined to do wrong. The shopping cart is supposed to go straight down the aisle. And you get a naughty cart and it goes, yeah, and runs into people. You, know, you, you kind of let go of it and rolls a little bit and hits somebody, you know? And that's a picture of an inclination to do wrong. I've got another <coughs> picture in video format here of somebody who goofed up and what having an inclination to do wrong can lead to. Okay, so this trucker pulled off the road to get some sleep. He parked his truck and he didn't even realize that it was on a very slight incline and he forgot to set his air brakes. And so he goes in the back and gets in bed and he falls asleep and doesn't notice that the truck is starting to move. And as you saw, it picked up speed all the way across the parking lot until it ran into the back of that sedan and destroyed the trunk of the sedan and pushed it through the other car. Well, this is a picture of what happens with an inclination. That truck was parked on a downhill incline and it picked up speed and destroyed things. Yes, Abby. Can I see it again? Sure. One more time here. Here it comes. Watch top screen left. Well, it's like he's going over a parking curb. Yeah, he does go on a curb between okay, parking lots. Okay. He was parked in a lot up higher. Stop, stop, stop. The car stop. Oh, no. I know. Darn. Oh, please. Well, that's not good. No, it isn't. No. No. Big mess. Yeah, that guy's probably no longer a truck driver. Um, so, the, the idea, guys, is... That's another picture, just like the shopping cart that always goes left. You park a vehicle on a hill without brakes on, or without putting it into park, and it will roll. It will follow the incline downward. And in this life here, our hearts, the Bible makes it clear, each one of us has a heart that is inclined to do evil, to do wrong, to walk away from God. And so the author here is begging for God's help. Oh God, help my heart not to incline to always do the wrong thing. But God, I want you to help turn my heart towards your word and towards doing the thing that will bring you honor. Don't let my heart charge after dishonest gain. I.e., things that you might steal or... Um, and some other examples, and we often think of it, dishonest gain is like uh, physical things. But I've known people that have have gone about getting dishonest gain by lying. We've seen people who've lied about their resume and what school they went to. They wanted to get a job that they were not likely to get without lying. Also, people lie about what they did or didn't do so they don't get in trouble so that they don't so that they get paid more than they should at a job or there's all kinds of examples where you can not necessarily quote unquote take something but by lying you can seek to get dishonest gain another one that you don't even wouldn't even think of normally is when you gossip or you slander someone because you're trying to take away from them their reputation by telling other, th other uh, telling other people things that you shouldn't be. And usually, the heart of the person that's gossiping is to make yourself look better, 
to make you look smarter because, well, at least I'm not as dumb as this person who did whatever it is you're telling others about. And these are just three examples of, of dishonest gain. And the author here says, God, don't let me do that. God, please help my heart because I know my heart is like a runaway semi. You park it on an incline, it's always going to go and smash and destroy. But God, I need your help to turn towards your law and your rules. Yes? And I think of that verse, you also have to be careful of what is your motive for doing something for yes. someone else or mm -hmm. something here at the church. Are you doing it for that person because you love that person, you care for that person, or are you doing it for recognition? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're doing it just so people will go, oh, she's so nice. Or are you really doing it for Jesus? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's a good point. Um, another example from the Bible of someone that's inclined to do something comes from Proverbs 26, verses 10 through 11. It's like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who, who repeats his folly. In other words... Um, I, I, I found videos of this on YouTube, and I went, yeah, I won't show everybody that because I don't want to make anybody vomit. But dogs have this really horrible habit of puking something out, and then they go and they start sniffing at it and smelling it, and then they lick it, and then they eat their own vomit oftentimes. And the author of Proverbs, they've obviously been doing this for a long time, because the author of Proverbs has seen this, and he is, he is painting... Um, and, and Proverbs, those same three rules and verses apply. And this is an example of a type 1 verse. He is using synonymous <laughs> parallelism to make his point. He's saying, a fool is just like a dog going back to his vomit. Always does the same dumb thing. And God says, don't do that. When you do that, you are as dumb as a dog going back to its puke. Don't do that. And then the next verse is scary, too. Do you see a man who's wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. In other words, a person, an example of a person who's wise in their own eyes, is somebody who will not listen to advice. Somebody comes to you and says, you know, I think you really hurt that person's feelings, or feelings when you said that. You're like, oh, whatever. That's an example of somebody wise in their own eyes, like, oh, I'm above that. I don't have to listen to your advice. Who cares about your opinion? Just one example. Someone who's wise in their own eyes. Teenagers who tend to look down on their parents or look down on their teachers. Oh, they're so stupid. I can't... You're not going to learn anything if you're not willing to listen to other people. Especially authority figures that God has put in your life. And this is a big one with teenagers. Wise in their own eyes. We have this inclination, especially when we're teenagers, to think we know it all. I think we've got it all figured out. And if our parents would just leave us alone, we would live our lives so much better than they make us do it. <laughs> and God says, uh, yeah, no, not so much. Uh, in fact, if you, don't, if you and I don't learn to humble ourselves and listen, there's more hope for a foolish person than for us. As teenagers, you need to be aware that this, this is a tendency. This is an inclination of a teenager's heart to think that they're smarter than their parents and smarter than the teacher and smarter than... And it's something that gets you into all kinds of trouble. It gets me into all kinds of trouble. If I don't listen, if I don't at least process and think about it and take a minute and go, oh, wait a second. You know, they might be right. So... Uh, our first point to live by is, without Jesus' work in our hearts, we will always do evil. And even, there are many people in this world who do apparently good things, but like, uh, uh, like Karen said a minute ago, you can do the right thing with the wrong motive and it still be evil. You can give to the poor, which is good, Jesus commands us to do that. But you can give to the poor so as to be noticed, so everyone will think, oh, what a great person. Oh, 
And if that's your attitude, then you've actually done evil. You're trying to bring glory to you, to me, instead of to God. So we all have this inclination of heart. Without the work of God in our lives to stop us, like the brakes on that truck would have done, we will go downhill and crash and destroy our lives. Just the way it is. And you and I gotta face that fact. You and I are not smart by default. Because of sin, we will do dumb things all the time. Without God, without parents, without the authority figures that He's put in our lives to direct us, to stop us. We did talk about how in verse 36, that is uh, one of those antithetical parallelism sorts of verses, type 2, that you have two separate ideas that are put in tension. Oh God, turn me to your word so I don't chase after the wrong. And verse 37, turn my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. What type of verse is this, Jordan? What does revive mean? Revive means to bring back to life. Oh. To bring back energy, to bring back uh, passion. Basically, <coughs> or another picture would be to wake up someone who's fainted. So, turn my eyes away from vanity and revive me in your ways. What type of verse is this? Of those three types we showed you earlier, what type is it? Three. One, two, it's, yeah, it's actually type two. It's it. <laughs> Jordan's just guessed them all. Um, it is actually type two, where it's two separate ideas. Turn me away from, and wake me back up. Turn away from one thing and bring life back to me. And. Um, Vanity, I looked up the meaning of this Hebrew word and the range of meanings that it could have are, are the ways that I should say that it, it is translated in the Bible. Our vanity, which is the most frequent, it can also mean nothing or nothingness. It can mean falseness or fakeness. It can mean idle, like an idol or something of uselessness. <laughs> Or it can mean an empty plea, a worthless phrase, worthless words. That store of vanity. What? There's a store of vanity. Yeah. There's a store of vanity. There is a magazine called Vanity Fair. Um, our society is all full of vanity. The idea being, God, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things, things that have no purpose, no point, no use. And it reminded me right away of Proverbs chapter 31, where it says, Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears <coughs> the Lord shall be praised. Think about that. When I, when I hear that, God is saying that beauty is vain. Beauty, in the long run, serves no purpose, because, well, we all get old, and then we die. And I don't care how beautiful you were as a teenager, no person in a coffin is beautiful very long. That's our end. There's, there's no point to beauty. And you look at our society, and how do we, how do we value beauty in our society? Yeah, it's what drives many people's lives, both men and women. And God says... What's really important, according to the Bible, is that we love and serve God. And here he says, God, turn my eyes from looking at vanity, from even being tempted to look at evil. Now, you guys know that evil is all around us. In fact, I was searching for uh, some stuff for this lesson, and I typed in a phrase on Google and... And I even had my search preferences set to strict filtering, and something came up, and I was like, ah, what in the world? Click, delete, you know, close, close. 
It is all around us. But the question is, yes, it's all around us, but do you turn your head away from evil? Or, or do you turn towards it? When there's a TV show that's inappropriate, do you turn it off? Or do you hit the record button? When there's a conversation you know dishonors God, do you excuse yourself from it? Or do you dive in wholeheartedly? And here the author says, God, I need your help. Turn, turn my eyes. Keep me away from, keep my heart away from desiring <coughs> these things. And wake me up to your ways. Give me energy to walk in your ways. Why does that take energy? It's because all of the inclinations of our heart are to do evil without God's work. We need Him to revive our hearts. So, point to live by number two is what we put before our eyes, and I put in parentheses before our ears, gets into our hearts and it directs our lives. Those songs that keep going through your head, the movies we see, the magazines we look at, the websites we visit, the conversations we have, those things get into our heart even if you don't want them to. The things that you focus on, get in there. And that should cause us to turn to God and say, oh God, turn my eyes away so that I won't look at, so I won't run after fake things. <coughs> and, and I see, you know, we've talked about beauty and all of that, and guys, I, I'm convinced too that a lot of, the majority of teenage dating is vanity, is of no point. I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not trying to take away your fun, but I just see so many people getting hurt by dating when they're too young. And just waste their time and waste their life and their emotions. Yeah. Did you date when you were a teenager? I wasn't allowed to date until I was 16, as I recall. Yeah, my dad. My so dad I didn't. Let me date until 16. Good for him. <laughs> no, no. Good for him. <laughs> Good for him. That is excellent for and him. And then he said, no. no. And then my dad got mad and said, 30. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yes, you want to ask that? Well, that'll, that'll teach, teach you. Yeah, that'll teach you. Well. <laughs> I'm like, I will date when I date. Here's. Well. When I'm 16. I'm not dating when I'm 30. I'll date when I'm 30. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure your dad was 30, teasing you when he said 30. 30. Is the year he was probably just giving you a hard time. <laughs> but what we put before our eyes. So what that means is we got to be really careful with what we put before our eyes and what gets into our hearts. And in my experience, I have seen, like most of us understand, that... Um, that things like pornography and risky photos and swimsuit issues and stuff like that are not honoring to God. But girls, like a lot of the romance movies that I see, do the same sort of damage in a different way to women. They make you desire, oh, I wish somebody would love me, and oh, I wish this, and it makes you unhappy with where you are right now. And it causes you to incline your heart to chase after men more than you chase after God. And I've seen this time and time again. <coughs> and so be careful what you put before your eyes and what gets into your heart. <coughs> because sometimes it's easy to be like, well, it's not openly sin because God wants us to get married in His timing and in balance in His way, not to chase after it with all your heart because what almost always ends up happening when I see somebody do that, whether it's a man or a woman, is they, they end up finding somebody who's not a Christian. And they so desperately want to be married and be in love and have romance in their life and all that, they're willing to turn away from God and from His ways. God doesn't want that for you. So be careful what grabs a hold of you. Because the, the whole vain things, the whole worthless things, it, it's a bigger category than you may 
Verse 38 says, establish your, your word to your servant. In other words, make your words, your commands, your Bible verses, make them stay in my heart. Make them hold on tight as that which produces reverence for you. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. This is a uh, uh, type 3 verse, which is a synergy. Taking two ideas and making them one. 39. Turn, turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Reproach is just somebody mocking you or making fun of you or... or um, the other word that comes to mind is disdain, but I don't know that that one will help much. Um, he's saying, God, help me not to be made fun of. Help me not to be hated by others because I want to follow you. And here's an example of the author who is afraid of something. He's afraid of being mocked. He's afraid of being hated by the people in the town, being reproached, in other words. turns to God. He says, God, I'm afraid of this. God, please help me. Turn that away from me. And in that culture back then, it was even bigger than it is in high schools and junior highs today. Like, I know what it's like to be afraid, like, oh no, people are making fun of me, they're mocking me. Um, that used to happen to me with basketball, because I couldn't play basketball to save my life. And I, Like, the kids in my youth group at church were so mean, I still am not very good at it were so mean, they would literally yell out, like, I would be open and no, or because no one would guard me because they knew if I shot, I would probably miss. <laughs> and, which is horrible, and you're laughing at me. Well, as an example of reproach, when I came to basketball, I was a reproach. And he was saying, God, turn, turn that away from me because I'm afraid of that. And, and then he says, for your ordinances are good. He's, uh, he's recognizing God's goodness. And then the last one. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. And this one, I believe, is a type one, actually. Behold, I long for your precepts. In other words, God, I back to, God, I want your law. I want you and your word. Bring life back to me through your righteousness. Revive me through your righteousness. <coughs> and um, I know, again, guys, that sometimes it seems like the ideas can be very similar, and yet you can see how last week we talked about turning to God in a tough time. This week we talked about inclining our hearts, and the natural inclination of our heart is to do wrong. And it seems like Psalm 119, his every solution for our lives is God and his word and his law and how he tells us to live. If you're sad, turn to God and to his law. Cry out to him. If you're in sin, turn to God and to his law. Cry out to him. And I hope that that point is getting embedded in your hearts. And from tonight's lesson, the idea that you and I have this inclination to sin. You and I are kind of like a semi-truck parked on a hill. And without God to stop us and turn us around to go the right way, we're going to run down and destroy our lives just like that semi did in that little video clip. There is a battle on for your heart and for your life. And the patterns that you put in place today in your life can often make a big impact on the outcome of your life. That's why you got to be so careful. <coughs> the patterns of how you eat, the patterns of how you dress, the patterns of even how much sleep you get, whether you brush your teeth or not. All of these little patterns that don't seem to make much difference. For example, you don't start brushing your teeth if you haven't already. Trust me, it's going to cost you thousands of dollars in dental work and lots of pain and heartache. There's a bad outcome. Yeah, you need to. 
Some people, yeah. Well, some people don't start brushing their teeth and they pay the price. And that's one of those patterns. This is an example, a very good example of a good pattern versus a bad pattern. Proverbs and Psalms are all about God, help me, help me avoid the bad pattern and help me establish the good pattern based on your law. Based on how you want me to live. And so the choice is really yours. Are you going to grab a hold of God's good patterns and God's good habits and God's law and make those part of your heart and your life? Or are you going to just kind of go with the flow, go with what's easy, and go with what our society says? Because they'd be glad to influence you and they'd be glad to push you down the wrong path. But you have to choose. If you're going to follow God, it's a choice. It will take energy. It won't be easy. But it will be so worth it in the 